Hey everybody, Haku here with my review for book one of Legend of Korra. So, this series, a little bit of uh, background for how I watched it. When it first started airing, way back when, I don't know, like 2010, 2011, I watched the first book as it was airing week to week, but then I fell out of it. It was just that point in my life, going off to college and all that. And uh, when I moved around when I started college, I didn't have, like, just regular TV, you know, I just watched everything on YouTube or Netflix or Yayo Yayo Sail the Seven Seas. But, um, then in 2014, around the end of the series, I believe Nickelodeon put everything, like, everything was on, I think, their website or something like that, and I watched it all there years and years ago. And then, just recently, the past month or two, I went and rewatched the whole series. I've watched a bunch of reaction series on it. Uh, so I've seen it definitely a bunch of times by now, if you count the reactions I've watched. Um, but I really, really love Legend of Korra. I really do. I think it's a great series. And one thing that I always say about it when asked is that a lot of people give it a hard time because they're comparing it to The Last Airbender, which is understandable because it's connected to that series. It's basically a sequel to it. Um, I count it as more of a sequel than a spinoff, really. Um, but the thing is, it's unfair to compare anything to The Last Airbender. Because to me, you compare The Legend of Korra, or just Legend of Korra, to any other animated show, whether cartoon, anime, or anything, it kind of beats damn near anything else pretty easily. But then you compare it to The Last Airbender, and it's just not fair, because The Last Airbender is the closest thing I have seen to perfection in fictional storytelling. Uh, whether a book, whether a game, whether a show or a movie, the last, like Avatar The Last Airbender is the closest thing to just perfection. So it's not fair to compare anything to that, because it's going to fall short. But on its own merits, Legend of Korra is really really, really great. Um, now, also, there, were, there was something else I felt like I was meaning to say. Oh, uh, yeah. So, that actually segues very well into what I'm about to say. I originally was like, okay, I have a lot I want to say about this series, a lot I want to talk about. Uh, let me do like I usually do, take some bullet point notes, um, just to help so I don't forget anything. Well, I'm going to be forgetting stuff because I started taking notes and I was like, this is too structured, this is too unnatural feeling. I just need to hit record and talk about this series. So that's what I'm going to be doing here, is I don't have any notes, this is full extemporaneous, I'm just going to be sitting here with you all for however long and talking about the series. So if there's some ums, there's some pauses, if it's not structured, like exactly point by point, um, it's just because I'm talking about the series off the top of my head uh, and how much I enjoy it. So my thoughts on book one specifically, hmm, let's see, to start this out, oh, also really quick before I get into like a in, more in-depth review of this, uh, this was voted on and won on Patreon, so the way I'm going to be doing things is there's going to be a poll up every week uh, for what I review the next week, so I'm doing it publicly for everyone on the YouTube community tab, and that's what the poll for the next review will be. So if you want to uh, decide on what I review next, go check out that on the community tab. And then it'll be on Patreon, and this one, one on Patreon, which is why I'm reviewing this now. But going to alternate back and forth. One week it'll be public for everyone, another week it'll be patron only. But uh, so yeah, thank the uh, patrons for getting this selected. But uh, yeah, just wanted to let you all know about that before I get into uh, this more in depth. So I would need to talk about my first impression on the books to really give you a better idea of, about how I feel about book one. So when I first watched like um, week to week, I thought it was good. Didn't think much of it. Like I said, like I wasn't like super, super invested when I watched everything for the first time, like for realsies in like 2014, I thought that. Again, like most people think, I thought book three was incredible. I really enjoyed book four and book one, but I felt like some of the things in book four I was kind of eh about, and book one, I really thought the romantic aspects hurt it. Um, 
And then book two. I didn't like book two very much when I first watched in 2014, but I'm glad going back and rewatching in like 2020, just like last month, going back and rewatching, I loved book one. I think that the romantic stuff doesn't hurt it as much as I thought it did all those years ago. Um, I loved book one. I still loved book three because book three is still amazing. It holds up well with even any of the three books of The Last Airbender. Even the first book of The Last Airbender, I might put below book three of Legend of Korra. Book three is just so good. Um, and book four is incredible again. Book two, I actually ended up really loving book two this time around. Now, some of the stuff that I disliked the first time around, I still think are weaknesses this time, uh, but I, I just loved it a lot more rewatching. Uh, so yeah, those are my thoughts generally on the books. And that helps you understand here that one of my biggest problems with book one, I thought before, the villains, Amon, the Equalists, were great. I thought the cast of characters were great. Um, the romance, to me, is just what hurt the series a lot uh, when it came to book one, when I originally watched. But then rewatching, I still think it's not good. It's not ideal. It's not the best. It's like, does it detract from the series and how good it is? Sure. Would book one be better without it? Yeah, cut it out and it'd be better. But it doesn't detract as much as I initially thought. Uh, it doesn't just take you out of the story as much as I initially thought. And this isn't just a Legend of Korra problem, to be fair. It's kind of an anything problem. Anything that's not romance. Like, it's not that I dislike romance even. If I were to list my, like, top 20 anime, a good three or four of them would be romance series. But to me romantic subplots in series that aren't romance series often take away from the series or make it worse. Like, they're just generally not very good. Like, I think comedies can usually get away with it better than some other genres. Like, a romantic subplot in a comedy can usually still be done pretty well. Um, again, most of the time not. Most of the time it does still detract if it's not a romantic comedy. Um, but action series or fantasy series, adventure series especially, like romantic subplots in them, 95% of the time are just kind of awful. They're just not very good. They take away from the story. And I think it's one of those things where, again, you're coming off of Avatar The Last Airbender and especially book three of that, where one of the like most wonderfully written things is like, Aang isn't like, oh man, I just, I care too much about girls to go after the Fire Lord. No, the focus is always on defeating the Fire Lord, even though he has feelings for Katara. And one of the best things is even when he tells her, you know, hey, I have feelings for you. And Katara's like, we've seen her slowly over the course of the series build up feelings for Aang as well. And she's just kind of like, yeah, I it's kind of confusing, kind of complicated. I think I have feelings for you too, but right now we're in the middle of a legitimate war that took my mother from me, so we kind of have bigger fish to fry. There's kind of more important stuff going on, and we can think about this a little bit afterward. So going from that to something where it feels like we get distracted from the airbending training, which seems pretty important in the grand scheme of things, we get distracted from that uh, by the romance stuff and uh, also getting distracted from like the equalist, just big important stuff with the romantic stuff, I think does detract. Um, but uh, another thing that might be the issue here, and uh, sorry to talk about so many criticisms here toward the beginning really, but it's just that like, Again, it's, it's much easier with a review to talk about, like, what could be done better than it is to just be like, ah, this part was perfect, this part was amazing, but I will get to all of that. Um, I think another issue is that it was a, uh, like, love rhomboid parallelogram something going on that, uh, the people just, I don't know, they can generally get annoying where it's like, ah, oh, this character likes this character and this character likes this character. That can make something that it's already like a subplot in a non-romance series. That's something that can make it even more annoying. So I get why people don't like it. I get why I think it detracts. Um, but it really isn't as bad as I originally thought when rewatching. Um, 
Now, to talk about the characters a little bit, I actually really like Korra a lot here. She's a bit immature. That's something a lot of people complain about, but the thing is, she's been trapped away her entire life uh, in the South Pole, so it's like... I don't know what what do you really expect from her? And another really really great or really great quote that I once heard somebody say about Legend of Korra and Avatar: The Last Airbender is that Aang's story is the story of a person learning to become the Avatar, uh, because Aang was just a person and he was thrust into having to be like, okay, I got to learn all these elements and defeat the Fire Lord. Uh, that's a lot to put on him, whereas. Legend of Korra is the story of an avatar who has to learn how to be a person. And that's the thing with Korra here is that she was basically just raised and trained to learn all the elements and to fight and all that. But when it comes, but she was sealed away when it comes to forming connections with people, when it comes to things like romance or friendship or like spirituality or the grander morality of what she should do with her uh, role as avatar. That's the stuff that she never really learned and is just thrust into. So for Korra, I like that distinction. She's an avatar learning to be a person, you know? Um, so I like this. She's immature here, but she's just really cool. I love her design. I always have. Um, I, I, I just think she's a really good, fun character. Now, I'll also mention, I'm, again, jumping all over the place because I don't have notes to keep me constrained. Uh, the animation, amazing. I loved it. I think it does get even better in book two, but book one's animation, great. Uh, Asami, I really love as a character. I always have. I think in the later books, she's underutilized. She isn't given the respect she deserves, but especially in book one, uh, Asami's really, really good. She has a great journey with multiple different twists and arcs throughout the uh, course of the season. Now, partially that's because I have heard they didn't originally expect it to be as long, so she was maybe going to be a villain, but they had to change plans. Um, but I'm glad things worked out the way they did with her character. Uh, Bolin is amazing. He's really, really funny. He's just a good guy that you can root for. Um, I don't know. Bolin's just an entirely likable character in, even what, in every way. His, uh, his bending is cool. Mako, to me, would be so much better, again, without the romantic subplots hurting his character. Because I think, generally, a lot of the fight stuff that goes on with him and some of the development he goes through that isn't related to the romance stuff is good. But the romance stuff with Mako and in terms of his character really, really, really hurts his character. And I think Mako is written much better in future books, but at least for book one, he was just not very good. Um, at least towards the middle sections. I think towards the end, actually, I don't know, even towards the end, because like, okay, to go through the story a little bit and give some thoughts, I think the opening bits are really good. I think slowly introducing the Equalist, um, but it definitely doesn't feel too slow. It feels like a lot happens every episode is nice. Uh, I didn't mention Lin and Tenzin. Tenzin's amazing, but gets even better as the story goes on. Lin also is amazing. I liked her from the start. Uh, underutilized in book two, but at least that's remedied in the future with like book three and so. Um, Lin is one of my favorite characters, actually. Uh, there's Iki, Milo, and uh, Jinora. I love all three of them. All the Airbender kids are good. Again, they don't play too much of a role here, but as they develop into their own individual characters, I think they get better as the uh, series goes along. Uh, Pema, I think, is really funny as well. Uh, again, a character we don't always get to see a lot, but when we do, I think she's always pretty funny and uh, sometimes has some good wisdom for various characters. Uh, and then also one character to mention uh, is Iroh, the, uh, the grandson of Zuko Iroh. So he is cool in book one. I'm going to say that he's cool in book one. If we're just reviewing book one here, he's cool. It's just that after this, lame. You gave Iroh's name to this jobber. He does nothing after this. Nothing. Nothing. Doesn't even try to do anything after this. So, Iroh, for book one, awesome. After book one, lame. Uh, then, of course, we get uh, Amon and Tarlock. I always, for some reason, I've always been, I always call 
Tarlock Unalak sometimes, and Unalak Tarlock, and then there's also Tonrock. They just all have very, very similar names. Uh, but Tarlock and Amon are very, very good characters. I love them both as sort of the mini villain and the greater villain of the season. The ending with them in Endgame is incredible. I just, I remember, again, first watching it, being really shocked and amazed at, like, Nickelodeon allows this this type of storytelling but it was great it was it was heartbreaking and devastating but understandable and reasonable and ah, it's, it's just so good um so yeah towards the middle again we have a bit of the romance stuff thrown in here and there that detracts a little bit but generally the pro bending stuff is cool and enjoyable i think that to me first watching i didn't like it that much because i'm like oh you turn this combat style into a sport but nah uh, in hindsight it's much better um and then uh the stuff with the equalist was amazing all the way through all the investigation stuff uh the little teeny air of mystery to it there really wasn't much mystery involved uh all the fights like the fight on top of the dome with uh cora and lynn fighting the equalist is really good um lynn's sacrifice is just an incredibly incredibly good moment and then at the end you could tell it was one of those endings where they're like you know we don't know if we're getting multiple seasons or not so we need to make this a satisfying conclusion as is and that's why we get the romance stuff at the end that detracts a lot from like again Lynn getting her powers back is such an amazing and emotional scene Korra getting her powers back and talking to Aang is like the most just incredible and emotional scene at the end but then one thing I don't like about it is we go through this arc throughout the season of Korra coming to rely on Tenzin and start to start to rely on Tenzin and understand where he's coming from and accept him as a mentor uh, throughout the course of the season. But then at the end, like, Mako is the one, she, he kind of like gets in between them and is like, no, this is about us, this is about our romance. I, I know I'm dating Asami, but I'm just going to run off and kiss you. And I guess Asami's just screwed here. I, I don't care about her feelings whatsoever. And it makes Mako seem like kind of an asshole, kind of a douchebag. Um, and it also just, I don't know, it it feels like it disconnects from the journey that Korra's been going on just because they're like, we need to hurry up in case we don't get another season. We need to have her get the guy. Um, so I am so glad that it didn't end here because I think that her ending up with Mako in such a shallow way would have been a really cruddy, like, full ending. For a season ending, it's eh. Like I said, if, again, cut the Mako bits out, like, she gets her powers back, and it's such a really cool, beautiful, emotional moment. And then Mako runs in, and it's like, what? Why are you here? Um, so, I don't know. It is annoying. It is an annoying thing that I think the episode and the show would be much better without. And it's a big complaint, even from a lot of people who, like me, enjoy season two. A big complaint I've seen from season two is, like, their relationship is just awful to sit through in season two. I actually don't mind it as much. I, like, some people absolutely hate it. Again, I don't mind it as much, but I will absolutely, if we're looking at this critically, say that, yeah, it's not very good. Yeah, the se like, the season, book one, would be so much better without the uh, romance stuff in it. But hey, all's well that ends well, I guess. And the future books remedy that and then some. Because uh, it's not really a problem at all. The few romantic things we get in books three and four I think are great. And even in book two, a lot of people hate it, but I think it is less distracting, less of a problem than book one. Because book one, a lot of the romantic stuff feels like really, really forced, like really thrown in there, where even though it's messy, even though it's toxic, even though it's not a great relationship at all in book two, I don't mind it because the storytelling feels a lot more natural and the romantic stuff that goes on in book two kind of helps to, it, it helps with the development of their characters away from the romantic stuff. So, again, I don't think it's as, as big a problem there as in book one. 
So yeah, that that was my general thought, I guess. I talked about the characters, the story, the production's just amazing, the music's amazing. I love the setting um, with how Republic City looks and everything. I love the amount of time we get at the air temples later on, at um, the uh, Water Tribe in Book 2 and later on, and in the Earth Kingdom. So my only regret, again, I'm getting way ahead of myself here, is that we never really got, I know they had kind of planned on doing a bunch of Fire Nation stuff, but they thought that, nah, let's shorten the uh, plot, make it a bit more concise, but I really wish we would have got some Fire Nation stuff. That's the only complaint I have for Legend of Korra. So, like, I always say that, like, for me, I, I just love this IP. I want more of, um, I want more of the Avatar world. I don't care if it's the Avatar after Korra. I don't care if it's a random past Avatar. I don't care if we go back for a book five of Legend of Korra or even a book four of The Last Airbender to continue on with those characters because I still think there are stories that could be told there. Um, but, uh, but yeah, and I have watched the first book and few episodes of the uh, Dragon Prince. I actually reviewed book one. I kind of dropped book two after a while because, I mean, again, the romance stuff. The romance stuff just was not good in book two of Dragon Prince. I'll have to try to continue it or watch it again at some point because uh, I really did like book one of that. But it just, as much as I did like um, Dragon Prince, it didn't fill the void left by Avatar. So, uh, yeah, I, I suppose that's it. That is my uh, my full thoughts on this. Whenever book two gets voted in, or book three gets voted in, or book four gets voted in, I'll review those. Uh, but until that point, when I get to those, because there are like a million things I want to review, which is why I'm just leaving it up to voting, just pick five of those things I want to review, throw them up and be like, hey, which one do you want this week? Um, but I am excited for... Uh, for more Legend of Korra when I get to talk about it. I'll probably do it off the top of my head like this because I think this worked out pretty well. Um, so yeah, hope you enjoyed. Like, comment, subscribe, follow on Twitter if you want. If you want a link to the Discord server, ask and I will give you a link. It's free and open for anyone. If you want to help support the channel on Patreon and get to vote there and everything, it's patreon.com slash of the tubes or a link will be in the description. It really does help me to keep making videos in general. Um, yeah, that's that's it I suppose. Thank you. And I will uh I will see you all next time.